and hit call, and it gave me all the numbers. But I get All right. Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome. My name is Christine Albright. I am one of the career consultants here at the University of Toledo Career Services. Um, our session for today at 3 o'clock is resumes and CV. So we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, first, I would like to give an opportunity to our guests to introduce themselves. Um, I will say some of our guests have been here all day with us and they've been doing an amazing job. So I want to say thank you um, for sticking with us this whole time. You guys have been such a wealth of information and we really appreciate you attending these sessions with us. Um, so for our resume and CV session, I believe we have someone here from Nationwide Children's Hospital. If you could please introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. Hi everyone, my name is Hillary Kessler. I am a town acquisition partner at Nationwide Children's Hospital in Columbus, Ohio. Um, the main part of my role is really doing um, strategic like digital recruitment marketing and then also just pipeline building with um, colleges and universities to help their students and new grads and alumni find their dream job. Thank you. Um, I believe I also have some people here from Target. So if you could go ahead and introduce yourself and tell us a little bit about yourself. You might have to unmute your mic as well. We mute them all in the beginning. So you might have to mute or unmute it yourself. Oh. Hello. Hey, this is Keon with Target. Sorry, guys. Hi, Keon. Can you tell us a little bit about yourself? I would love to tell you guys a little bit about myself. Um, hi, everybody. My name is Keon Rayford. I am a BGSU alum. I'm from Toledo, though, so that's good news. Um, I currently work for Target. I started out my career in Michigan as an executive team leader, and I am currently a senior executive team leader for service and engagement. And I actually do a lot of work with the University of Toledo and BG at a lot of their on-campus events when we're not practicing social distancing. Thank you. Do you have any of your colleagues that are on this session with you, or is it just you this time? No, no, no. So uh, when I look in here, I see a couple of my colleagues on here. I know we all have been having just a little bit of issues with the microphones. So I know that they're on a call and they're, um, I just think they're trying to get their audio connected. Gotcha. All right, well, if um, any of them come in and they want to go ahead and introduce yourselves, um, feel free to shout out, let us know. If not, I'll go ahead and move on. We should have one additional guest, um, I believe, from Joanne Fabrits. Do we have anyone here from Joanne Fabrits? Yeah, hi guys. My name's Taylor. Uh, I'm with Joanne. Uh, I'm a manager at Talent Acquisition at our headquarters in Hudson, Ohio. Um, and I actually just transitioned into that role. So before I was a corporate recruiter uh, and a field recruiter for us here at Joanne. Um, and I helped anywhere from hiring our, our store leadership, um, helped with and still help with managing our internship program and any transitions into full time work. So I uh, work a ton with our local uh, Ohio students. So excited to chat with you guys today. It's my first session. So thanks for having me. Thank you for joining us. I, I'll kind of uh, put it back to Target if we have any other additional uh, Target guests who would like to introduce themselves. 
Hi, everyone. My name is Courtney. I am a human resources executive team leader with Target. I work at the Canton, Michigan location, but I am a University of Toledo alumni, so I'm really happy to be here with all of you. Thank you. All right, so before we go ahead and get started in our Q&A session here, um, I just wanted to remind our students that if you look in the chat box, you'll si see a link to sign in for this session. Um, and I'd encourage you to sign in for this session so that if we have any follow-up information or if you would um, like to learn how to get a copy of this presentation afterwards, uh, we have your contact information to be able to send you that. So um, we're gonna go ahead and get started. If any students do have any questions along the way, feel free to type your question into the chat um, and then we will relay your question to our guest here. All right, let's get going. So the first question that I have are, what information are you looking for in a resume? I'll hop right in. Um, this is Keon with Target. Um, I would say for um, our experiences and just my personal experience, um, basically what we like to do is kind of basically want to find out as much information as we can about the applicant in regards to job history and maybe organization history if they maybe don't have a long list of employment. Um, just as much on paper. And I think like what I use that to do is to figure out what people we actually, uh, I guess just to help us source, right? What people do we really want to bring in for interviews or, um, you know, what people do we want to maybe put for a later interview just in case of graduation dates or anything like that. So I would say just getting facts about our applicant. This is Simone with Amazon. I don't know if you guys can hear me. Oh, hi Simone, go ahead. Can you introduce yourself first? Yeah, yeah. So um, my name is Simone. I'm with Amazon. Um, I recruit for recent graduates and college seniors for our Amazon fulfillment centers. Um, so mainly for human resources and area manager roles. Um, and I'm super excited to help out today. Excellent. Thank you. And did you have a comment about what information um, employers are looking for in your resume? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So I will, I'll, I'll just hop off of what Keon said. It's very important to have that job history on there. Um, and even if you don't have job history, you want to, if you have an internship experience, you're going to want to put that on there. Any leadership experience, volunteer experience. Um, I think it's really important to put that on paper because that's kind of what we go off of and seeing whether you're going to be a quality candidate or not. So it's going to be important for you to write out um, all the highlights about yourself so that we can see that in you. Can you guys hear me? I think. Oh, yes. Yes, we can hear you. You can hear me. Oh, my gosh, I got through. Um, so this is Sharice. I'm actually from Target. I'm the human resources business partner um, for District 148, which um, is a part of Northern Ohio areas in our store. So um, I just kind of wanted to add on to what Simone was saying there. Um, specifically around like the community thing. So, um, you know, Target in, as a corporation is really big around community and our connection to our um, guests outside of the building. And so one of the things that I always look for is what are they doing in the community, whether it's like volunteering, mentoring, um, how are they connected to human beings outside of like just the work experience? Because that's a really important foundation for our company, um, especially for the district that I run. So I like looking at things like that that are, um, again like not necessarily skill sets but like what does your involvement look like with other areas outside of the professional world i think Sorry, to Charisse's yeah. point um and i think uh, this is kind of what simone was saying but like write everything you know i think simone was kind of saying and like it, that's your opportunity to really showcase us you know what but pretty much all your skills and what you've done and if you know Sharice is looking at your resume and she's looking for somebody who possibly you know is connected deeper to the company than just you know a resume you might have an organization that you did two years ago that you might not think is important but that might be exactly what Sharice is looking for yeah i would piggyback off of that as far as what we look for at joanne is i mean collaborations kind of what we do all day every day so even if you don't have maybe previous internship experience but you've worked in a team environment we love to to hear about it, but first and foremost, see it on your resume. And I think that's super important to be able to showcase 
and to kind of piggyback what everyone said is any leadership organizations you are a part of or community involvement outside just shows us that you step above and beyond uh, and get involved in and collaborate with teams um, not only in the workforce but outside of that as well so that's super uh, super standout thing that we look for on resumes Something else that we um, kind of get asked about a lot, and I wanted to ask you guys uh, when it comes to resumes, is keywords. So students always ask about like how important is it to have keywords in a resume, and how do they actually figure out or find out what those keywords should be? Um, I'll hop right in. Um, I'll, I'll talk about like. When I was getting ready to graduate college, um, I redid my resume. And um, I honestly need to redo it now. But what I like to do is um, just think through better words or just uh, better vocabulary words to utilize. Because um, you can only use the word effective so many times. You can only use the word um, challenge or spearhead. And honestly, to be transparent with all you guys, I look online, they have a long, long, long list of different synonyms and different words that you can utilize to. Uh, make the vernacular in your resume sound pretty impressive. And then I would say to kind of in that same realm, let's say you're applying for like an engineering position that, or a position that is a lot of uh, maybe technical things. I think putting a lot of technical vocabulary rather than uh, more social vocabulary, sounds like that, if that makes sense. I want to build yeah. off of that too. I think it's important to make sure that your resume is malleable. Um, so making sure that with every application that you submit, you're able to adjust your resume to ensure that you have the proper wording and vocabulary usage across it. Um, because like he said, there's a lot of words that are interchangeable. So if we're utilizing the proper terms to maybe match what the organization is looking for, that's going to make your resume stand out. And then on top of that, making sure that you have some sort of quantifiable metrics on your resume. So if you have led a team in the past, make sure you include how large that team was by the number. Or if you led some sort of initiative and you were an award winner for however much money you gained in some sort of fundraiser, make sure you include that dollar amount. Knowing the exact numbers and metrics is key and it helps make your resume stand out. Yeah. I think and Courtney just, Kian, oh, please, please, please oh. go first. <laughs> so Keon and Courtney's point, um, just around like those, those active words, um, one of the things that I always did was look at um, what's the company's mission statement and like what are they driving and what are like the active words that they're using and how are they using it and what actions are they or what culture are they driving, what actions are they driving, what mission are they driving. Um, I think that tells you one, not only what that company wants to do and if that fits aligned with your skill set, but it also um, helps you align with, again, like their mindset, seeing eye to eye with that company. Um, and it kind of, I think it kind of um, probably sparks some ideas from that as well. I'm not saying copy word from word, obviously, uh, but I think, you know, it helps to have an idea of, you know, what does that company, what is that company already looking for within their own verbiage and um, what action words are they already using for what their team is already doing? I think it's super helpful. Yeah, a good place to find that as well as the job description of the specific job that you're looking for. I know, you know, some jobs require different skill sets, right? And if you just have Microsoft Excel, but we want to know more for that certain job or it's something we're going to ask you about and we can find out about that on your resume and you can articulate that even further for us because you tailored your resume to the job you're applying to that also stands out. Good, thank you. All right, so our next question is, how can candidates best explain gaps in employment or and or lack of experience? I think um, <laughs> I'm going to go back to when I was in college, um, and I would love to hear what some of the other um, employers think as well. But when I was in college, the way I would explain lack of experience was just I would speak to my potential. And I would speak to um, the things I, I was already proficient in that I could utilize to help me. So I think in college, I was very proficient in Word and other Microsoft functions. But when you're interviewing for some position, they're like, hey, we want somebody that's very proficient in Excel and they're pivot tables and these very specific things. And, or they want somebody who knows who's good at uh, data mining or analytical skills. And I've never done any of that. So 
I think what I did was did research around what exactly the company wanted from me, and then I would use that to speak to my potential and how I could come in and transform either what they're doing or I guess is what I could do different or better than what I see possibly. Yeah, I think that's important. Um, and I also think, you know, what can you provide? Do you play a sport? Um, have you led a team project uh, that you did in school? Um, there's always something that you can think about, even if you don't have experience that you can use in an interview or on your resume. So I think um, just really sitting down and thinking about what you've done in your time at college, there's plenty of things you can pull from, um, but really taking the time to think about those so that you can use that on your resume. Yeah, I've even seen uh, some students that are graduating and, and might not have had like an internship experience or something, put volunteer experience or shadowing experience. Um, I always think shadowing experience is super impressive, even if it's something you did with your class or a school, because it shows your you know ability to be curious uh, and learn from those experiences as well. So that's something that I've seen uh, supplement really well for maybe not having that corporate environment experience or something along those lines. So I know I get this asked a lot with students um, in relationship to this. If a student does have like a little bit of lack of experience, maybe they haven't had an internship or a co-op or anything. Do you pay attention or do you think it's worth listing some of those higher level courses, like those 3,000, 4,000 level courses that are related to the field where they can demonstrate that they have knowledge of the field or area, but maybe not necessarily the experience? I think even elaborating further and saying like, hey, I took this 3000 course, but uh, tell us about like a project you did in that that showcases your ability to put that information and what you're learning in your academic experience into action. I think I, I like I get more maybe from an engineering student if they tell me about a project they led or a lab that they were a part of and a couple bullet points to that versus just listing the class because sometimes we're not going to know exactly what that class means. If we didn't attend that university or do that coursework ourselves. I think to, to the point she just made, I was kind of thinking about it myself. I think what I would recommend is just try and be able to speak to it maybe, you know, even if it's something that, um, if, it, if you learn some things in a course and you think they might apply, I, I don't know that, you know, putting that course number on there, because then you, you have the question of what course is this? Uh, was it, you know, was it a challenge? Because there's a lot of variables, but I think if you can speak to how you might have done some data analytics in this project and how you had to pull a pivot table to do this, but it's not something you do every day, I think that might still be um, what the company would want from you, or at least, you know, allow you to get another interview so you can talk to it more. Hi, this is Ty. Um, I'm also with Target as a human resource executive team leader. Um, I was going to say, too, maybe something to think about instead of putting the coursework on your resume, this might be a good time to leverage the relationships that you have with your professors, and maybe they would be able to write a letter of recommendation for the work that you were able to complete while taking the course, um, which also really drives, like, how you build relationships and how you really work throughout your time, especially in those last couple of years. Question from the chat. All right, it's from Kanisha. She mentions or asks, should you, you know, omit an experience or volunteer work if it was done once over a couple of hours in one day? I would just say, like, and I would, uh, this is just my opinion. I think for me, when I have experiences like that, I just think through what can I, can I really speak to what I did? Like if the interviewer were to ask me more questions about it, can I really confidently answer all their questions or would I be kind of, you know, pulling from just, just pulling out of nowhere to figure it out? But I'd be curious to see what other people think as well. I think if it doesn't have, um, if it's relatable to the job you're applying for, then list it on there because it will add some more context to your resume. But then too, if you only did it for a few hours, but you were a super integral part of an event that happened or you did a lot of you know behind the scenes or just jumped in last minute because you 
saw that, you know, help was needed, like, I still think that's relevant. Um, and the skills that you might have brought from that that you might not even know about are things that I can probe and ask more questions about to kind of pull those details and make up for maybe some gaps or a lack of experience that you have. It just gives me a little bit more to work off of if it's something that truly like is in relation to the job you're going for. If you volunteered for like four hours at a petting zoo one day, I don't know if that's gonna be really relevant, but if you, like I said, with an event or um, community service or you know those types of things, I think are important. Um, and it depends on the organization too. Like we have some events that different, you know, um, sororities and fraternities help put on or sponsor, and those might only be a couple of things. But again, it just opens up more, like room for me to ask what's your involvement and you might know more about my organization just because of those few hours that you spent with us and that's what drew you to apply for a job. I do want to piggyback off of that um, because a lot of I heard was relevant. So you also want to make sure that what you're putting on your resume is, you know, fairly relevant to the position that you're applying. Um, I'm sure as HRs and recruiters, we've gotten resumes that have been two or three pages long. Um, and then it becomes kind of a chore for us to work through what exactly is applicable to what you're applying to, or if it's just kind of fluff for content on their resume. So whatever you're putting, whether it's volunteer um, experience, whether it's caseload, coursework, just make sure it's actually um, relevant to what you're applying to. And we as recruiters and HRs don't have to kind of look through your resume to see exactly what it is that you're looking for and what your intent is in applying. Absolutely. And to piggyback off of that, a good way and a good indicator to know that you did your research for the job is to read through the job description. So what is it that that company is looking for? And then kind of use that as a starting point to say, okay, what skills do I have that can transfer to this role that they would see on the resume and say, hey, this would be a good candidate. They have those transferable skills that are needed for the role. Um, so just viewing the job description is an important step. Um, when you know applying for a job thank you all right we're going to go ahead and move on to our next question <clears throat> sneak in with a, a question from the chat yes please this is from Hassan. Uh, should a resume have an objective section at the beginning of a resume? It's a very interesting question. So I, I think resumes in general um, can be like almost left up to your interpretation to some degree, because like I see some resumes for people who have been working in industries for years, like just a ton of time, and they, they do have an objective and I'm, and their resume is like two pages. And I'm like, well, do you need the objective there? And I think in my experience, it's kind of like what I like to think through, because I like conciseness. I like, for me personally, when I'm giving my resume out, I like one page resume, so I don't have an objective. Um, I would say, I, think, I don't think I got rid of my objective until I was like in my later years in college, where my resume was like pretty filled out and I felt like I didn't have a lot of white space. But I, I would say for me, it's one of those things where if you have space truly and like you have a lot of white on your resume, and you can make an objective that's particular for that job. I don't think there's anything wrong with that, but um, that, that's my opinion about the objective piece. I would agree, and I, I same exact thing here. Slowly removed that so that I could keep mine to one page as well. And um, I think we read so many objectives that are like I'm an outgoing and you know collaborative individual. And and so I think if you are going to have an objective, make it unique or. If there's something unique about what you're seeking, I know it's particularly helpful if someone's graduating, but they're still open to an internship. Um, that's helpful information to put on there for us. Uh, so if there's something that you want to make sure that you're stating um, that you're open to or interested in that might not have been said through your experience on your resume, that would be a situation where I would put an objective as well. I don't know if this was already said, sorry, my like internet cut out and I came back in after a couple minutes. Um, but as an FYI, and it varies on the volume of applicants and, you know, the level of roles, but as a recruiter, first glance, we spend like seven to 10 seconds looking over your resume. So 
whatever you put on there, make sure that it is important, it is sticking out. So if you have a really strong objective or you're able to call out some of those skills or what you're looking for, that's important. But if it's like kind of just, you know, there to be there, I probably, I would read that and then would just kind of like quickly glance over and move on. So just make sure that like whatever you're putting on there, it's relevant, it's important, but then, you know, really focus on some of those more important pieces within your experience or what you're looking for. Like I said, it all depends and each recruiter you talk to, but for those who have high volume of candidates um, or applicants and have a high volume of jobs they're working to fill, like first glance truly is like seven to 10 seconds. And that sucks to hear, I'm so sorry, because I know you put so much effort into, you know, building this resume and perfecting it, but it's unfortunately a reality in our world. I think to her point though, like using it as a benefit to you, I think as students, like the fact that you guys know that and the fact that you guys know you're going up against all of these people that are on the phone call, all these people, you know, throughout the world, like put something in there or use a color or use something that's going to make me like catch it in that seven to 10 seconds. Like, I think that was perfect what she just said. Like, I remember my college resume I had, um, and this is just my own personal thing. I had an orange trim that went all the way around my resume. And it was because I did feel as though a lot of the people I was giving my resume to, you know, these are large companies here. I'm at a job fair with a hundred and plus other people. I just want you to keep mine in a stack of people to interview. And I think that's a really good point that she just made for you guys. I mean, that's the honest truth of it is a lot of these people are looking at 50, if not hundreds of applications to put, you know, find a way to make yours really stand out for them. So I'm trying to do some quick math. So last year, so um, I work for Nation My Children's Hospital. We're in Columbus. We're the second largest pediatric hospital in the country. Um, we received 92,000 applications last year, and we have about 13,000 employees. So we have a team of 20 recruiters. So that breaks down to like 4,600 resumes that each recruiter was looking through. And um, on average, we work, you know, basic salary is 280 hours as a full-time employee. So, I mean, the numbers are kind of scary when you do them that way, but just putting into reality, like depending on what organization you're looking at, I mean, yeah, it's at seven to 10 seconds, but you're also competing with potentially 92,000 other people which as a job, as the job market changes, it could be good. You know, before the pandemic, we were in a candidate mark driven market. So really, it was what the candidate wanted and it was tough as an employer to find those top candidates. Um, unfortunately, it's kind of on the flip side now because there have been so many furloughs and layoffs that when things are really picking up, you are going to be competing with, you know, top people. So just make sure that you're doing a lot to spell out why you are so special and you have all of this experience and the value you could truly bring. Um, Cause really that resume is kind of our first impression of you. And one more question. Uh, this is from Bahadu. Their question is how important is it to include publications in their resume? more than likely be a, a situation where someone may have been a part of research or what have you. I hire I think, research people. Um, you, and go ahead, you go ahead. Okay, so it's really important. We hire um, in our research, Abigail Webb Research Institute, that's what PIs wanna see. Um, they wanna bring in people who, you know, are really in the know with the research they're doing. They have the experience and the knowledge with whatever, like, Right now we have um, a new PI in our Childhood Cancer Center and she's looking for a research assistant who has experience with zebrafish. I am not a science person, it is way over my head, but apparently there's some correlation with some protein or gene that zebrafish carry and linked to childhood cancer. But um, so she's like looking for those specifics. So for us, like on the research side, it's a huge benefit to you um, and super important. And I know it can be make your resume a lot longer, but that's something that the PIs, like as a recruiter, I probably have no idea what I'm looking at, but when we would send that on to the hiring manager or the PI, that's really what they're looking for.
I think that kind of plays back into um, kind of our question that we have up here on the screen. We kind of skimmed over a little bit. So we get a lot of questions from students about resumes versus CV. What's the difference? Um, and so typically, you know, we tell students that, you know, CVs are found a lot, you know, with medical or with an academia research, that type of stuff. Whereas resume, it really is geared towards. Um, so I guess two parts of this question is, do you guys agree with that? And then also, what types of positions require CVs versus resumes? And should a candidate have one or the other or both? I would agree with that. I would say, you know, Joanne, as a retailer, we're typically looking for a resume. I can say I honestly don't see a ton of CVs. Um, if you're in an industry that, you know, is is geared toward that, I think it never hurts to have both prepared uh, if that's, you know, the type of industry that you're going for. But um, I would say we typically only are looking for for resumes. Yep, I would say the same thing for Amazon. We're not really looking for a cover letter, but um, if you do provide it, um, that's fine, but we're not really looking in requiring a cover letter. Um, so I would really just focus on that resume. But like she said, um, just depending on the company, um, every company's different. So it would be nice to have one prepared if so. I think uh, depending on the industry, um, it's probably good to have both. So again with the company, um, depending on the applicant tracking system that they're using, you probably will only have the opportunity to upload one or the other. So I think it's easier if you have both prepared. And then obviously if you're going into something within academia, you're gonna wanna have a, Z a CV. Um, but if it's you know a more entry level role, the resume will work. And then once you make that connection with the recruiter, you can always pass your CV along via email or share it with the hiring manager once you get into that interview. Um, it really just depends. And I think that's where, if you can use your network to reach out to a recruiter before, or you know, talk to some people that work at that organization when you're getting ready to apply or in that process, it can really kind of eliminate some headaches for you, but also make sure that you're starting off on the right foot and getting the right information in front of the right people. Yeah, and I think if students really have a question about what is the difference between a resume and a CV, um, they are always more than welcome to connect with career services and we can kind of help them with that. Um, but just as a quick reference, you know, CVs usually tend to have more information on it based on like research presentations, that type of stuff. Um, and so I agree with you guys in saying, you know, looking at the, the role that you're applying to and the industry that you're looking to get into might determine whether you're going to want to use a CV and a resume um, based off of what information they might be looking for from you. Devlin, do we have another question? just popped in. Uh, this person, I think it's Paul, if I'm second, um, they ask, an engineering graduate there, uh, what is your opinion regarding bullet points versus paragraphs on a resume? Um, I'll hop in. Um, I, in my experience, like I, I think a couple other people kind of hit on this. You know, when you're thinking through the amount of time that they're going to have to really read your resume and really look at your resume, I just think in general, trying to be as concise as possible and, um, you know, use bullet points. Now, what I would say is fill in the white space. Like, if you could picture a piece of paper and you're writing across, I wouldn't, you know, I wouldn't have a lot of really, really, really small sentences, so it doesn't look like you have a lot of content. You know, this is where the vocabulary comes in. This is where um, if you needed to add more words to, to you know, fill in that. But I, I would say bullet points are, at least in my experience, the way we want it to go. I would second that for sure. I think if you're looking to use paragraphs or full sentences, you can convert it into bullet points. So I'm like trying to think of an example that would make sense. Um, so if my experience says I am a recruiter at HMI Children's Hospital and I say in 2019, I filled 300 requisitions, then in my paragraph, if I had one, I'd probably say, 
I filled 300 requisitions using LinkedIn and career builder and Instagram and whatever sourcing to find X, Y, and Z. I can, you can always just make other bullet, bullet points, you know? So like build 300 requisitions, indent bullet via or utilized LinkedIn recruiter, Instagram, I don't, whatever to fill in that way. So you're still getting the content that you might have in that paragraph, but it's just simplified and again, easier for me to read, um, but I'm getting the gist of what you were trying to say. And again, if it's, you know, pulling pieces from the job description that are relevant and applicable, then that's really what I wanna see. I think that was a really good point. Like for anybody, you know, who's kind of thinking like the concept you have is very important and you want all of that on there. I just think find ways to kind of break up a paragraph into bullet points. You know, if you really, really, really want to highlight everything you did in this and uh, you, need, you need to be very descriptive, I would just try to find very descriptive bullet points. And you, like she said, you have sub bullets and all of that, but I, I think that was a really good idea. I also think that's where some of those keywords come into play as well. You're not just writing an extra sentence to write an extra sentence, you know, to Hillary's point earlier, you know, she's talking about the tools that she's using to do this. And those can be keywords as well, because it's different systems that you've learned um, or interacted with. I think too, that when you begin utilizing paragraph format on your resumes, you will open the opportunity to include a lot of extra words that may not be necessary. Um, to add an additional fluff. So I feel that it's more important to be concise, like I've said previously, utilizing bullet points and lead with strong action verbs that you may have pulled out of the job description or just anything related to that position. Great, thank you. All right, so our next question is, what are the common mistakes employers see in resumes? I think we spoke to how little of a time that recruiters sometimes spend looking at resumes, um, but I will say once it hits a hiring manager's email to review or whoever's actually gonna be interviewing you, Spelling mistakes are probably one of the most common and most pointed out. So they're like, hey, this person's not paying attention to detail. Um, we're looking at things pretty quickly from a recruiting perspective. So I would say one thing for college grads too is like expected graduation date or graduation date, something that I see commonly missing uh, that I really want to know. So I think Keon pointed that out earlier is give us all the information. That's one of those things that uh, we really hinge on because we want to know when we can hire you. Um, I would say those two are, are probably big ones for, for early grads. And to piggyback off of that, I would say even before it reaches the hiring manager's eyes, um, lack of detail, I think that's a big thing. And we kind of already talked about that, but um, it's important because we do take uh, a little time to, you know, initially review that uh, first glance of the resume. So I think the more detailed you can be and the, the better it looks, um, those are important points to have. So this sounds really silly and maybe I'm just super specific on this, but I will sometimes get a resume and my biggest thing is like, there's no contact info on it. And I'm like, what in the world? What, how would you? And I get that it's in the profile you built, but then there's a second layer to that where maybe the phone number or email you put on your resume does not match what's in our system. And then it really stinks when I want to call you and extend an offer or you know see if you're interested in an interview i can't get a hold of you so just make sure you know whatever you're using that it's consistent on both your profile but then your resume and it's the best form of contact for you um i think as you you know continue to kind of grow in your career you know there's a lot of research that's you know and studies have been done that say you don't need to add your um address on there and those types of things like, I'm not really worried about that. I just want to make sure that I have the best way to contact you, whether that's, you know, preferably your phone number and your email, um, but at least one that's correct is super important and overlooked because it seems kind of obvious. Yeah, I get wrong phone numbers quite often and it, it does stink. I will say 
the location, especially for graduates, some of you guys might be looking for work that's back home and maybe back home is in Toledo. Um, I've seen some people put their student address as well as their home address or even just the city and state is helpful because I know uh, if I'm talking to an Ohio State student and I call them, they're like, great, do you have any opportunities in Columbus? And I'm looking at their Cleveland, Ohio address, maybe that's their home address. We're looking for people in Cleveland, Ohio. So um, if you are interested in both areas, you're open to staying near school after college, things like that, um, that's always good to put on there as well. So like to go off what Taylor just said, now that I'm thinking back to the whole objective statement, if you are in one city, like your, where you're going to school and where you might live, if you have an objective, you could write in there, open to relocating within you know, the state of Ohio or the tri-state state area, whatever. There's where an objective would be helpful with multiple addresses. I don't know if anybody said this, but it might sound kind of simple, but um, I just like casing and spelling errors. Um, a lot of times it's, it's more like uh, the simple things like the there and theirs, uh, just utilizing those or even just literally typing in two words will be together. Um, a lot of times we don't think about it because you're just changing two things on your resume. And, you know, you, you I've done it myself. You know, you make one or two changes on your resume, you print it out, you think it's good, and you look and say, oh, no, I didn't capitalize this letter. Like everybody's been saying, you got to take a ton of time to do a really good job with these resumes, and you don't want something like that holding you back when you've spent, you know, days and weeks working on it. Yeah, to Keon's point, um, I think another thing that I look at, and this may just be a me thing, but like consistency. So if you use full sentences with periods and punctuation and like your education part, but then when you get down to maybe your volunteering or activities, it's like just all like bullet points, like I just like, when I'm reading, I think it's just, it just looks better when it's just all consistent. It's like we either do full sentences or you do bullet points and like quick ideas or quick thoughts. Um, Cause I think, again, it makes it more uniform, um, but that may just be a me thing and, and what um, makes it easier for me to read through things or um, keep things like all together or thoughts together. I would agree with that. That's something I pay attention to as well, but. I would say also um, the order in which your resume is in. I see a lot of people putting like, in 2007, I babysat, and then at the very bottom of the resume, it's like an internship. And I would have loved for that to be the first thing that caught my eye. Um, so that's another thing as well. I think sometimes people can do it backwards or even like mixed in between. Uh, it's always best to put your most relevant experience up top. And to build off of that too, actually something that I learned in my career development course at UT, was that splitting up your resume to have more of your leadership experience completely separate from the rest of your work experience is not a bad idea. So having your leadership experience fall right under where you're at for your educational studies will prioritize it and put it more towards the top of your resume to catch the recruiter's eye. So you guys have talked a lot about being really like clear and concise and purposeful in your resume. Um, when it comes to length, uh, we you know typically hear about you try to keep it at one page. Um, do you guys attention to length, whether it's one page, two pages? Um, how much should students weigh with it to the length of a resume? I would, oh, go ahead. Okay, I, I, and I was curious to see what other people were gonna say, but I think in my experience, like I was a student who I really, really, really thought I was gonna need a two-page resume, like when I was getting close to graduation, because I had done internships, I was super involved in a lot of organizations, and I was definitely thinking like, oh, well, I'm gonna need two pages, and I had a couple professors and people who looked at my resume, they were just asking questions around like, if I needed the content on there, and that's kind of what I would say is just ask yourself, you know, when you like, so I think Courtney said it a long time ago. She said, uh, have a resume that's malleable. And I was going to bring this up. But what I like is having like a master resume with all of my work history on it, like every single thing I've done on it, all my organizations. And I can pull from that to make a new resume before I go interview for a job. And that's kind of where I cut down my resumes. It's like my master resume is like two pages. But when I write up a new resume, I'm not putting everything from, maybe 2014 on there because I was in high school in 2014, you know? 
But I, what were you going to say? Yeah, no, exact same thing. I think uh, I did the same thing. Having a master resume and then being able to have like an a la carte menu of your experience was super nice. Um, even with working professionals, I think a lot of times one page suffices. Um, I, I know particularly like my experience applying to Joanne versus maybe like the healthcare industry, right? I had several HR internships, but I also had some retail experience. And I knew at Joanne, what I was interviewing for would be hiring retail leaders. So I felt like that was extremely relevant. So I kind of swapped one internship out for that because they got the gist that I have some HR experience, but then I also know the role that I'm hiring for as well. And I think that, you know, that allowed the recruiter to focus on that more and ask me questions about it. And that led to a lot of really great dialogue and conversation in the interview. So if you can tailor and, and keep it to one page, uh, your resume to the job you're applying for, it goes back to that. I think if you have multiple pages, make sure the most important stuff is on page one, because in my seven to 10 seconds, most likely not going to get through all page two or page three. So, I mean, if you have them, you know, and you want to include all that, I think that's okay. Um, but also just realize that what we're looking at on the screen is like, we can go through the pages really quickly, but when I print that out to like hand to a hiring manager, it's like, three, four, five pages, they're kind of like, like, what is happening? Why is there so much on this for a new grad? Like, you know, we're not expecting you to have all of this experience and, you know, have all of these different jobs and internships. So sometimes, you know, having multiple pages can actually be a bad thing. So, you know, put your most important stuff on that first page. And then if you have to have a second page, make sure that it's still really relevant. But I probably wouldn't go more than that um until but you know that's also different like if you have a cv then it's going to be a ton of pages or if you are at like a senior leadership level if you hand me a one page resume i'm probably gonna be like why are we even interviewing you like depending on the level of the position you're applying for again the industry like there's so many differences but i think as a new grad you know coming right out of school probably one will be your sweet spot and then maybe a second but really focus on the one you know, make your margins like really small. You can move your font down to like size 11, play with the font to see what's smaller, you know, all of those things to kind of cheat the system. But I mean, at the same time, please don't send a resume that's like font five. And I have to like, you know, try to figure it out, like appreciate the creativity, but um, just again, the most important things like everyone said are really what we're looking for. Okay, I have two questions from the chat. It should be the last two that we have. We have very limited time. Uh, but the first question is from Hassan. It says, when an applicant is writing a cover letter, should he or she find the names of the recruiter that they're writing the cover letter uh, to the recruiter for? And if yes, what should the applicant do for online jobs with recruiters are not identified? I would say good rule of thumb is just to address it to the company. A lot of times I'll get like a hi Lisa and my name isn't Lisa. My partner's name is Lisa, but depending on who's looking at it, um, sometimes recruiters will have like their profile. If it's on a LinkedIn posting, like linked to that job, that's a good time to address that recruiter personally, or maybe even send them a LinkedIn message and let them know that you've applied. That's always something that stands out, but I would, you know, address it to like Joanne recruiting team or Joanne recruiter. Um, typically it's safer that way, I think. I think depending on the company you're applying for too, the system that, and y'all won't see this when you're applying, but on our back end, so the system that we use only allows to upload one cover letter. So the problem is it lives within your candidate profile and we are, you know, you could be applying for a bunch of different jobs that are going to different recruiters. And as a recruiter, I might see that it's not addressed to me and you know, whatever it's, you know, I, I get what they're trying to do, but hiring managers sometimes can take extreme offense to that. So I think being as, you know, the company name or human resources, talent acquisition, recruitment is pretty good. Um, and I would do that. And then once you move on in the process, so if you are coming on site for an interview and know who you're going to meet with, then maybe bring a cover letter that's addressed to that specific person. Oh, and you can call out like, you know, I noticed you were a UT alum and so am I. I'm excited to learn more about whatever. Like you can use that as like your introduction piece of it. 
Um, but then also depending on the position, like if I'm looking for a marketing position or someone to work in our foundation, those writing skills are really important. So I want to see it. But so many times we get cover letters that aren't even for our organization. Like it's, it again, it seems so silly. And I know you're just going through and you have it saved as like post updated resume and you're attaching it and hitting submit. But if you're gonna, you know, use a cover letter, make sure that you're really double checking it for spelling, grammar, it's addressed to the right person. It's vague enough to work to get your foot in the door. But then after that, you can always, you know, make it a little more detailed and specific. And one final question this is from Bridget. Uh, uh, they say, would a recruiter rather see a resume in chronological order or the order of re re relevance, if I can say it today, to the job being applied to? I can jump in here. I would definitely say uh, relevance to the job that you are applying for. Uh, we want to see that you have transferable skills or anything that is relevant to the role. Um, so while you may have had a lot of experience in different fields or industries, um, I think relevance to the role that you're applying for is important. I would agree. I think a, a lot of times it works out in the way that your most relevant experience is typically the most recent experience as well, especially as you progress in your academic career. But I, I think I can't remember who mentioned it earlier, but saying, hey, my leadership experience, that might be a good place right under education to spell out some of your proudest leadership accomplishments and accomplishments and some of the work experience that's listed chronologically underneath that as well. I think the same as we were talking about, like with having both a CV and a resume or having that master resume and then one specific. I think it's probably good to have both and a lot again depends on like the organization and the position you're applying for the way that recruiters you know are trained to read through these resumes they are looking for those things but i for some of like my hiring managers if i would send them a resume that's listed for most relevant experience and not in chronicle chronological order they might be really confused and it sounds silly but they have even less time to look at things so I think it would be helpful to have those both available if needed. Um, but then, you know, it's specific to each organization and what their talent acquisition team, you know, what their process looks like. So again, you know, networking, reaching out to those recruiters, you know, even the ones that, you know, are on these calls today, just so you can follow up if you are gonna apply, you know, at Amazon or at Joann's um, or at Target to get those specifics. So you're really set to be successful from the get-go. And I will say with career services, oftentimes to kind of help remedy that, we sometimes will recommend to students like even utilizing different headers. You know, you don't want 80,000 headers, but you could have like relevant experience so that you could draw your most relevant information towards the top and then have additional experience um, or something else below that so that you can still keep your information in reverse chronological order within each area, um, but still organizing it on your resume so that you can put your most pertinent and relevant information towards the beginning or the top of your resume. So, all right, well, we are really running low on time. Um, I want to thank our guest again for um, attending this session and giving us some great advice. We really, really appreciate you. Um, students, if you look in the comments section, there should be a sign in link. Again, we encourage you to um, sign in for the session. So if you have any follow up questions or if you would like any information um, or if we're going to send the presentations out, we have a way to get through to you. Also, if you are a graduating senior and you have not taken your first destination survey yet, um, if you visit utileo.edu and search first destination, uh, you can complete the survey, which really helps us in finding out what are you doing after graduation? What are some of your plans? Um, and that helps us as a whole to kind of figure out how to assist and help students in the future. So again, thank you so much to our, our employers for sharing us. Um, and we do have one more session after this. 
Our four o'clock session is titled What a Boss Wants, What a Boss Needs. So we will see you in just a little bit at four o'clock. Thank you.